Was tough, Dexter. Cutting up to his left and over the 10. Nice block there by Lehman. Tough still going. He's up to the 25. And now he's hit and hit hard about the 27-yard line. Bruiser Kennard made the tackle. We interrupt this broadcast and bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. In the weeks that followed the bombing of Pearl Harbor, America sent her young men halfway around the world, in both directions, not to conquer, not to pillage, not to loot, but to liberate. And they did, not only in the occupied countries, but in Germany and Japan too. One veteran, when asked what it all meant, said that he felt that he had done his part in turning the 20th century from one of darkness into one of light. Another said, Listen, I was 18 years old and had my whole life ahead of me. I had been taught the difference between right and wrong, and I didn't want to live in a world in which wrong prevailed, so I fought. And fought they did. They came from all corners of the United States, from different backgrounds, different religions, different classes. Some had been farmers or coal miners, store clerks, teachers, truck drivers, lawyers, and the like. Just two days after Pearl Harbor, President Franklin D. Roosevelt spoke to a frightened nation. We are now in this war. We're all in it, all the way. Every single man, woman, and child is a partner in the most tremendous undertaking of our American history. We must share together the bad news and the good news, the defeats and the victories the changing fortunes of war. We believed we were immortal. We believed we were doing a great thing. And we really believed in the crusade which we hoped would liberate the world from mayhem. In 1941, FDR spoke for the first time of the four freedoms, those unalienable rights that belong to every person in every part of the world. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy, peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear, which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. But these freedoms were not without cost. Great battles were fought in nearly every corner of the world. The Battle of Midway in Guadalcanal in the Pacific, Operation Torch in North Africa, Sicily's Operation Husky, and the invasion of Anzio in Italy. On June 6, 1944, D-Day, the greatest amphibious operation in world history was launched. Soldiers and sailors, who just months before had been schoolboys, led the charge to liberate the European continent. And their commander-in-chief led a united nation in a poignant prayer for their safety. Almighty God, our sons, 
pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. There is fighting every day. You can hear it down the road or in the distance. Sometimes when it's cloudy, you can't tell where the sounds of the fighting are coming from, but they're always there. The artillery booms, 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 and then is answered by the echoes in the distant valleys, all sounding like heartbeats coming up from the earth. Sometimes I'd swear that war is a living thing, huge and ugly, that eats up lives. While the battles raged overseas, Americans at home joined the war effort as well. The United States became the great arsenal of democracy, producing 300,000 military aircraft, 89,000 tanks, 3 million machine guns, and 7 million rifles. Millions of women worked on an assembly line. Americans of all ages gathered up scrap, rationed their food, bought war bonds, and supported the fighting forces. Never in the memory of man was there a war in which the courage, the endurance, and the loyalty of civilians played so vital a part. In a 1942 fireside chat, FDR told the world, This whole nation of 130 million free men and women and children was becoming one great fighting force. Some of us are soldiers or sailors, some of us are civilians. Some of us are fighting the war in airplanes five miles above the continent of Europe or the islands of the Pacific, and some of us are fighting it in mines deep down in the earth of Pennsylvania or Montana. A few of us are decorated with medals for heroic achievement, but all of us, can have that deep and permanent inner satisfaction that comes from doing the best we know how, each of us playing an honorable part in the great struggle to save our democratic civilization. When peace finally came, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote, When word was flashed that peace had come to the world again, I found myself filled with very curious sensations. I had no desire to go out and celebrate. I remembered the way people demonstrated when the last war ended, but I felt this time that the weight of suffering which engulfed the world during so many years could not so quickly be wiped out. There is a quiet rejoicing that men are no longer bringing death to each other throughout the world. There is great happiness, too in the knowledge that someday soon many of those we love will be home again to give all they have to the rebuilding of a peaceful world. One cannot forget, however, the many, many people to whom this day will bring only a keener sense of loss. For as others come home, their loved ones will not return. In every community, if we have eyes to see and hearts to feel, we will for many years see evidences of the period of the war which we have been through. There will be men among us who all their lives, both physically and mentally, will carry the marks of war, and there will be women who mourn all the days of their lives. Yet there must be an undercurrent of deep joy in every human heart, and great thankfulness that we have world peace again. The greatest opportunity the world has ever had lies before us. God grant we have enough understanding of the divine love to live in the future as one world and one people. Then I am 
Oh. Uh-huh. 